Arizona straight to the line. There's the snap to Murray. Murray looks left, pumps once, looking, looking. A lot of time. Now he throws, and it's intercepted by the Lions. Picked off down the left sideline. Orlovarier picks up a block at the 30, 25, 20, Amani 10, 5, and he's spun out of bounds right there. I see you, 24. I see you. Welcome to the 20 Minute in the Huddle podcast. I am Detroit Lions senior writer Tim Twentyman, and it's a fun time here in Allen Park this week because we got OTAs, and OTAs means offense, defense. It means rookies joining vets, and my guest today knows all about that, both from a player side and a coaching side. Look, he's an eight-year NFL veteran, uh, played for Buffalo, Indy, Miami, uh, New York Giants, uh, finished out his career here in Detroit, um, 2015 with Miami, 105 tackles, and uh, you know is now the Lions linebacker coach. And so, uh, welcome, Calvin Shepard. Thanks for joining the 20 Minute in the Huddle podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And I I want to first start with you and so you're you have an eight-year NFL career right you finish up with the Lions in, in 2018 I believe yeah and then you go to LSU you're a player development guy there yeah. just when did you start to get that itch about coaching when did that that seed first kind of start start to bloom within you yep so a uh, crazy thing in my career you know you look at guys careers around the league and my peers and I mean ideally you would like to spend your whole career with the same team for multiple reasons, because that means you hit your second contract, they paid you, and just, uh, you know, you kind of build a foundation and leave a legacy with one team. Well, unfortunately for most players in the NFL, that's not reality, uh, for good and bad. Uh, in my case, uh, it was a little bit of both. Um, I was traded, uh, I was released, I've had it all. So it's so my career has allowed me to really relate to my players uh, in every aspect of the game, from being a third round draft pick and walking in as a starter to being traded to being released and having to get back up after being knocked down and land on your feet. So in my career, what it's allowed me to do as a coach has, has I think, done way more than the X's and O's could ever do mm -hmm. uh, because I can really feel I can put myself in those players' shoes. Uh, but as far as why, you know, what some people deem is crazy, you spend eight years in your whole life playing a game, why are you still in it? Yeah. For me, it's because – to be honest with you, I think it's my purpose and my calling in life. Uh, I've always been drawn to football since a very young age. I've played since the age of five and never missed a year. Uh, and to be honest, my last year I did spend here in 2018, and then I made a decision to retire. Uh, my seventh and eighth year of my NFL career, a lot of people might not know this, but uh, I was not on the week one roster. And what that means as a vet is your contract isn't guaranteed. Right. So. You got to grind even harder when, when when you do get the call, you go in. And I was fortunate and blessed enough to have that instilled in me at an early age, work hard and work for everything you earn. So in doing that, that gets tiring as a free agent. You say, all right, now I signed week four. All right, I'm in here. All right, now my last year, year eight, it's all the way to week seven before the Lions called me. You, right. you know, and I'm like, man, if this happens again, man. I don't know, like my family, one week, I'm a soccer dad, and I'm dropping the kids off right. at school. Next Another week, you're week on a flight, <laughs> flying somewhere, right? <laughs> like, <you know? laughs> so that's kind of what transpired in 2018. I had an enjoyable time here, great people from the moment I stepped into the building. Yeah. Like the people. That's what I tell people about Detroit, the people for me. And then uh, in 2019, I ran into that again in free agency. I'm really close. Uh, two of my mentors are Coach Campbell and Coach Spagnolia the D coordinator for Kansas City. Right. So they were kind of like, you're going to be a coach one day. I'm like, I am not coaching. When I retire, I'm done with this. <laughs> like, yeah, they're like, we'll see. 2019, I made a conscious decision to retire. Six months into that decision, I turned on the TV and watched all my peers playing, and it was just a burning Got desire in me. Yeah, and I'm itch. like, man. And I'm So what did I start doing? I started calling some of my best friends, one of my best friends, JPP, Jason Pierre Paul. Yeah. Hey, man, I want you, you got to set that edge, keep the inside of it. <laughs> and then I'm calling me, I'm calling Debbie <laughs> Canard, I'm calling JD, surprisingly. Were you I'm watching more film at this point, too? Yes. I mean, were you just I'm, so missing I'm, the game yes, that you're like. And I'm on NFL. I had the red zone. I had the network <laughs> here. I had it. And, like, people were walking at me like, what are you doing? Like, And my friends would be like. Dude, why don't you just coach? coach? Like, stop calling me. It's in your blood. That's the point where you knew it was in your blood. A hundred percent. And then from there, like, I start feeling phone calls. And then uh, Coach Fitzsimmons actually was the special teams coordinator here when I was here. It was at Vanderbilt. And that's the first cold call I ever received. Wow. And he's like, are you interested in coaching? And that's when I knew it was my calling. I had never spoke to him about coaching or anything. 
got on the phone with him, interviewed Vanderbilt, offers me a job. Well, being an LSU alumni, they caught wind of that. Yeah. And Coach O's crazy <laughs> butt was like, there ain't no <laughs> way you are going to Vanderbilt. Pretty so, good yeah. impression, by the way, too. So, <laughs> hey, so he, so he offered me the job and I always give – you know, I pay it for it and let everybody know without that opportunity, I don't know if I would have ever been at this point I am to this day. So I always give credit to Coach O. He gave me my first opportunity in this profession to be a coach. And from there, uh, you know, I went there, grinded. Uh, I actually was the, the co-director of play development and lead defense analyst, working closely with linebackers. Uh, and so did you had that. both aspects of yes, it there, I, player yep, development and on coaching. On and off the field, yeah. which for me – is the piece a lot of coaches miss, in my opinion. Because when you're just coaching, it's X's and O's, X's and O's, X's and O's. But to truly garner another grown man attention and respect, he has to know you have more um, – it's more important things than just football to you. Right. And if guys feel that, they, they are going to give you everything you got. So then I got the call from Coach Campbell the night of his biting kneecaps off speech. <laughs> and, um, and he just called me to talk. And he's like – yeah. Well, I thought just to talk. And he's like, what you doing? I, I told him, he's like, you got some time to talk? Long story short, I didn't know that Chris Spielman and Rob Wood was on speakerphone in the background. Really? And we just talked for three hours. Wow. Literally, literally. Wasn't an interview. Wasn't just talking where I want my life to go, what I want to do with the coaching thing. And then it was like, all right, that went good. Yeah. All right, I'll talk to you later. How I'm much like, do you appreciate that that was the beginning of the conversation and that's where it went? I it, it it to football, me you know? it to me <clears throat> reeks what this team what this organization is about. Mm. We 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 all understand we're here to win games. Don't don't we will never get that misunderstood. But within that, how how do you truly achieve that goal? How do you pull every resource available into these players and get every ounce that they have out? That's Letting them know it's not all about football, man. It's real things happening in the world, tragedies, things in their personal lives. Listen, we get that. We get it. Let us help you. And in turn, you help us by giving us everything you got. And as long as you got that, but like you said, it started before. My official interview was a three-hour conversation with people of power in this organization. And that just, I mean, the second they even, then we talked again. Then they flew me up, and they couldn't even get it out their mouth. I didn't even know what my title was going to be. They offered, I said, yes. Yes. I, I just need to talk the coach up. And so many pl former players are part of this coaching staff, and that seems like the experience that they've talked about too. Yep. And, and, and why do you love that aspect of this staff, that there are so many former players? And, and the players talk about it too. Like, look, that guy will never ask me to do something that, he's never done before you know or been asked to do himself yep. or whatever and there just seems to be that up and down this staff and the players really love that from a coaching standpoint do you love coaching with guys with similar backgrounds as you two former players guys that have kind of now made the coaching profession to me and i heard coach campbell say this some of the best coaches in football have never put on cleats so we don't want to turn this into you have to be a former player thing because that's not true yeah but i'll tell you right now and nobody can hide this it's, it's the instant icebreaker. The second you walk in the room, you have the respect of the players. Why? Because you've done it. It's, it's not you sitting up here, do this, do that, do that, do this, do this, do this, do that. No, they're looking at it from a standpoint, listen, man, this guy played, and he played a lengthy career for a reason. Maybe I should listen, you know, and take heed to what he's saying. And like you hit on, I'll never, and this is something I really hold true, and you can ask any one of my players, I'll never ask them to do something, not that I've done but that I'll go do right now. Like, and the players will tell you, Coach Chef is crazy. Like, <laughs> if y'all don't think I can run and I'm in shape, let's yeah. go and I'll go run conditioning with you. If you think that I can't go and do a hook drop, try me. And the next day I'll have on cleats at practice and do it. So, like, when you still get to, You still get that itch? Oh, absolutely. And Brad Holmes kind of makes jokes <laughs> and things. He's like, Chef, I think you still got a couple snaps in you. I said, you may be right, but after about two series, my shoulders might fall <laughs> off. So... <laughs> So, well, you talked about titles. Now, you yeah. had the title last year of outside linebackers. Coach, you did a great job. Some Thank of the guys you. that developed there, Charles Harris jumps out, led the team with seven and a half sacks. Some of the young guys that came along, Julian Aquara. But now that, that role has expanded for you. Now Absolutely. you are the linebackers coach. So maybe just quick go through the difference and, and, and maybe the difference in responsibility that you have going into this year. To, to be honest, it is different. Uh, it's obviously more responsibility. Yeah. Uh, last year was actually – 
stepping out of my realm of comfort. And it's something I'll always have gratitude and appreciation for with Dan and AG. Because when they presented opportunities to me last year, we went back and forth. Okay, are you going to help Mark DeLeon as a, you know, kind of assistant inside linebacker guy? And then Dan kind of threw out the idea, Shep, I know how smart you are, man. Listen, I know you've never really worked with the front. Because edge rushers, really in nickel, they become defensive ends. Right. So you're kind of an OLB slash edge DN coach. So it was something that I've never been exposed to. But luckily throughout my lengthy career, I had knowledge of the front. But I, I, I will say this right now. Without Ty Wash, I would not have had half the success that I did. With that, And it's for multiple reasons. Obviously, the knowledge of this guy. Helping me understand front technique, pass rush, why we're doing things up front, why we're, but then furthermore, giving me the opportunity and the flexibility to coach my players. Yeah. And I know that was something new for him. And he opened up to me. That is one of the closest people I am to in Detroit, period. It's Ty Watch. But why? Because I owe that to him because of what he did for me in my career. My understanding of the front now has transferred and allowed me to extend that knowledge to my linebackers, which in turn, they play behind these guys. If they know what's happening in front of them, they play so much faster. Well, that leads into my next question. I'm glad you brought up Todd Walsh because I had a chance to talk with him a couple weeks ago and he talked about the differences, <clears throat> excuse me, in scheme from this year to last year and just how different that front is gonna look. Absolutely. Not only just going from three, four to four, three in, in the base, but you know, he talked about last year being a kind of a read and react. Absolutely. You would play off the offensive lineman and then you would make your move and how this year it's completely different. He thinks they had the personnel to attack up front. We want to play off the heels of the offensive Absolutely. lineman is how he described it. And so I'm curious, with that change up front, now how does that affect you guys at the second level and how much do you look forward to playing behind a front like that? As a linebacker, it's everything you ever wanted. To a react defense, you have to marry what's happening up front. So they can't be playing react and we're just shooting. It. No, when they play react, it's, it's a lot of principles that three, four systems have mm -hmm. where you see bigger inside linebackers because they're two gapish type players. Right. As far as attack is normally, attack react is normally involved with four, three systems, more attacking. And to be honest, that comes top down from Aaron Glenn. He is a dictator, in my opinion. He 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 is out defense. I know we are reactionary component in football, but we're flipping the table and we're trying to dictate to people and we're going to do what we do. We're going to do what we do and then we'll react on the move. But we are lining up and we're going after you and we're going to do what we do. And then depending on what you give us, we'll react accordingly. It sounds like a fun way to play as a linebacker. Oh my gosh. The <laughs> linebackers right now and just kind of dub doubling back on that. Now, like in some, some, some of my guys, I'm like, Man, you're going to come back home to my room and we make jokes because now, like, you spoke on Charles, a guy I've gr grown so close to and so much respect for him. His work, ethic, the way he carries himself, the trials and tribulations he made through in his career. Now, I lost my guy Charles. For the most part, he's in washroom. But we have different packages where they come back, I say home, you, you know, and I give them some love yeah. and send them back. But now we kind of split it. But everybody call him my son, but J.O. still with me because sometimes, like, we've pretty much split my last year room. Okay. And now half of those guys are true D linemen in base now. Right. Versus where last year we had two true OLB. J.O., you're talking about Julian Acquire. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I still got my son around me a lot, <laughs> you know. And, man, and that kid is getting better, and he understands his expectations. But just, I mean, top down, I tell you, Everybody owning the accountability piece, I think. And that starts not only from Dan, and Dan speaks on it. It starts from Sheila. Like, this is a top-down top down, operation 100%. where you you see these faces in the building. It's not like a thing where you just hear the names. And, oh, no, you walk down the hall, you're going to see these people. And you're going to be held accountable on things you say and on your actions. And that's what I appreciate. And for someone who's been here for 11 years within the organization, I can say that it, it hasn't been that way. And I recently wrote in, in a 10 Questions with Tournament article, too, that this is just the most optimism from ownership, management, coaching, all the way down. A collaborative effort, it seems, is in Absolutely. place here, much more than I've ever seen in my 11 years. And so to speak to what you just said, I, I think people outside of football operations see that as well. Oh, that's, man, because I feel it. Because I'm like you. I've been around. And, this is the most like I feel like you don't even know if you're here six hours or 12. You don't know the difference. And when you could build something like that, 
I think not only are you heading in the right direction as far as organizationally, but you're heading in the right direction as people. Yeah. Like, because that's how we all should live. All right, I want to get into the linebacker room a little bit. Yep. All right, one question. I want to start this off. One word that you would describe your linebacker room right now. And I know it's early. It's OTAs. We haven't hit the pads and all that other stuff. But what is one word you would use to describe your linebacker room as it currently sits? Well, they say this, but the temperature of the room is hot right hot. now. Hot. <laughs> and the reason, I like it. Listen, <laughs> and them guys are laughing. They heard this because they say it. Yeah. It is hot in here right now. They said because the competition is real. The competition is real, and it's been laid out. We do not know who the starters are going to be day one. And this is so cliche in this sport we play. You have a $50 million player you just gave, guaranteed buddy, to the coach standing up there saying, I don't know who the starter going to be. <laughs> and I'm over here. I'm his backup. Like, really? really? You don't know who I know. the starter? Like, this is truly. But you don't have you. that in the linebacker room. Bingo. You don't have that and in the linebacker room. some coaches gripe and moan, oh, I didn't get a high pick. I didn't get – uh, a, a, a high paid free agent where well, I'm the opposite. I embrace this because what I see are is I tell the players I see myself <clears throat> like I see myself in that room. Yeah. I see hungry players who are freaking biting and chomping at the bit of that opportunity to go and have a contract type year, a life altering type year, a Charles Harris type year. Like, and when you put six, seven, eight hungry dogs in a room, yeah. They have no choice but, but to rise. The cream's going to rise, and everybody always say that. And that's kind of what I'm dealing with right yeah, now. Yeah, because that is the on, uh, most unsettled uh, position group on the defense Absolutely. is that linebacker room. Absolutely. I mean, you really – and you spoke to it. You don't have a guy. I mean, you, you, you think Alex Anzalone is probably going to get a pretty good look inside, right? I mean, Derek, you hope he takes that next step. But there's no define you're this, you're that, you're that. You got guys – this OTA period, this mini camp should be – Oh, I, or, listen. And training camp should be fun for you. You get me fired up. You, you got to come down. Everybody knows <laughs> me. I get fired up when we talk this stuff because it is. Because listen who you just named. Alex Anzalone, Derek Bournes. Okay. What about Jerry Davis? Right. You, you, don't, you don't think he's hungry? Hungry. Well, what Wanted about to Chris come here, took, down, took less money to come here. Why? Do you love a guy like that? Oh, I, I sat next to him in 2018 in the meme room. That's right. Literally he, next his to rookie him. year was your last year. Yeah. Absolutely, Chris Board. You don't think he's hungry? Sean You're stealing Dion all Hamilton. my questions. You're stealing you all my questions. We gotta stop. We gotta okay, stop. Okay, you gotta let me. You gotta let me take this. I told you I get fired. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna now. get down because <laughs> we want to hear all about these guys. Because yes. there is that linebacker. To me, you look at you know obviously what they did to the defensive line and improve that via free agency in the draft. You'd like that. You know you've got depth at secondary too, but that is the biggest question mark at linebacker to me. And so. When you look at a guy like Chris Board, who's very new, uh, undraft or a free agent signing from Baltimore, and then Sean Deion Hamilton, a guy who really had a good training camp last year very before good. that in that injury, he was gonna be on this roster. Absolutely, his spot was there. So maybe just talk to those two guys first off. What does Chris Board bring to the table? A guy who was a special teams ace in Baltimore, but really started to carve out a role there, there especially go. on third down. A guy that can you know play in space Absolutely. and run, and then Sean Deion Hamilton. Maybe just give us the lowdown of what lines of fans can expect from Chris Board and Sean Deion Hamilton. First and foremost, I could talk football with you all day because you really know football. <laughs> I appreciate it. Because some guys don't see those guys. Like, they, they're special teams linebackers. No. Well, what are they doing? Look at movement skills. Okay, have they carved out a role? So I'll start with Chris. 70% of the NFL's nickel now. Bingo. Uh, you're in those. You Bingo. have to find guys that can play in space Bingo. at the linebacker position. So. Is that what Chris Board oh, kind of is? He has a unique skill set. And I'll be honest, I told him, like, and I told everybody here, the personnel department, he's bigger than I thought he was. Because you see him on tape move around, he moves like a safety. And then I saw him in person, and he's yeah. freaking stout. Yeah, he's, he's a, a big, big guy. I'm like, oh, man. You know, <laughs> so I'm very intrigued by that player and what he could provide mm -hmm. for not only us defensively, but for FIP on special teams. And then Sean Deion Hamilton, man, I had a deep heart to heart with him the other day. And I said, dude, I got it because he poured it out to me, his career, the transgressions, the everything he's been through. And I said, brother, let me tell you something. Everything you've been through, I've been through. I said, that's why I have the utmost respect for you. I said, but let me, it's, if you go out and I can hit play, that's the thing. You never have to ask questions in my room. If I can hit play, everybody in the room is going to know who the starter is. And, and, and I feel like if players feel that and if it's real and not just coaches yeah. talking – you're going to get everything they got. That's why you go watch practice. It is – them linebackers, I don't have to worry about loafs. I don't have to – because if you're not doing it, the next guy will. Yeah. And and that just going to keep going. And I'm sure you got – I don't want to step – but Josh <laughs> Woods, Malcolm Rodriguez, James yep. Houston. I mean, when you have this 
And a guy like Malcolm Rodriguez, when I could pop his tape on just this morning in the film room from rookie minicamp and something I taught him in one day he's going out executing, you don't think that gets the attention of Alex Anzalone? You got to. You don't think that gets the attention of a Chris Bull? Like, whoa, wait yeah. a minute now. Who's this rook? Six-round pick. What? And, and, and he knows. <laughs> he's in the thick of it. That's the thing. Dan Campbell, Aaron Glenn, they don't care who it is. And they don't they, care how you got here they, either. They, they don't care how you got here. Undrafted, late, day they, three. It don't matter. They, you are here. You're going to get an opportunity. It sounds and like. And if we hit play and you're the guy, you're the guy. Ask Jerry Jacobs. Ask A.J. Parker. <laughs> if we don't care. I can't even tell you what college J Jerry went to. He went to like five <laughs> of them. But it's like if – if we hit play and you're the guy, you're the guy. You're the guy. And that is what the NFL should be like. And that's why this place, man, it's, I got to calm down. Now. I got to get to it. <laughs> so you were a former player, and they talk all the time about the transition and, and the, the growth in your not only football knowledge but your production from year one to year two. How real is that as a player? It's a real thing if the player makes it a real thing. Okay. That's why I tell people, everybody, what did you do? It was so magnificent. I'm very open and transparent. I'm never going to act like I'm some guru. What I do is try to take the good things I've had in my career and apply them. I tell them and recycle them, and I throw away all the bad. What I deem was bad. Yeah. And that's what I give to them, man. And, and, and that is a real thing. We can go ahead and say it because I know with this, you're talking about Derek Bowen. Yep. This, 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 this is a player. It's no secret, and he knows this. It's on him. Yeah. The same way it was on J.O. last year. That is on the player. Now, I can give you all the resources and the tools to do it, but until you take ownership and accountability that it's the work I put in, the coach could give me everything. But until you go put the work in, that's when the results going to happen. No work, no results. Have you seen the work with Derek? Absolutely. Because the talent is, is so much there, Calvin. I mean, we see it. There were so much, so many flashes last year, but like any rookie, it's up and down. And I told him, you play a position that isn't flashy. I tell you, and, and I told him because he did. I had all these plays. You had 50 play cut up of him shocking blocks, getting off, running off, tackling, violent at the point of attack. He has it. But for Derek, it's above the neck. He hasn't played a lot of off ball in his career. Right. So it's seeing it as well. So I have to put him in those situations as a coach. That's where it's on me as a coach to let him see it, let him feel it, and then rep it, rep it, rep it. Now it's on you to beat out the guy. Beside you, behind you, or in front of you. Was it harder for that indoctrination to the NFL and that 3-4 react for him? And is it going to be easier now in this maybe more attacking like we talked about earlier where maybe you don't have to read it as much as it is I so think, much attacking? Or I am I off base a, No, that is a piece of it. He can play faster. Okay. But in that, your key's got to be right. Yeah. Because you could play fast going the wrong way, and that's even worse matter. than what yeah. we did last year. So – that that's, that's that's just where I go back to as a coach. I have to give it to him. I have to shove it. I have to give it. I have to give it. But as a player, you have to receive it, digest it, and go apply it. All right, you mentioned the couple rookies, uh, Malcolm Rodriguez, six-round pick out of Oklahoma State. Guy, really athletic, 37 and a half vertical, I think, 4 5 two, 40, uh, tons of production. And then a guy, James Houston, a guy who played off the ball at Florida yep. and then went to Jackson State and played more of a you know edge on the line and, and had so much production. What do you like? What do you think those two guys bring to the table? And, again, it's early. we got to see linebackers Absolutely. with pads and there stuff like that. Go. So we have to really – you know, football, we've got to talk about this. Exactly. Sense that we're watching guys in helmets and shorts. Okay, there's no contact here, but you can still, as a coach, yes. glean some things and see some things before the pads come on. And so maybe uh, you know one of the things you want you you can give Lions fans about what to expect maybe from those two young men who've just entered. This the I can say, which you can get with no helmets on. Malcolm Rodriguez is, is one of the smarter young players I've ever been around. Really, that I'll give to him, and I'll say that openly. That kid, but. It's because he's a naturally smart player, but on top of that, it's the work he puts in. This kid came in here in two days, and he knew both spots. Wow. Like, that, that to me, that stands out to me. Yeah. And I looked him right now. I said, you're going to get an opportunity, dude. I said, when you come in and show me things like that, you're, you're, you're going to get every opportunity imaginable to you to come make a push to play. Yeah. And then a guy like James Houston. James is a, what I call a football player. James, James, and James going to let you know. Coach, I ain't going to sit in this room. I might not be able to draw it and say it, but you get out there and you put them pads on and you get them out there on that field, you're like, holy. He just finds I thought you didn't know that. Yeah. 
and I'm talking about his <clears> technique, <throat> execution. Not if he finds the football, but being in the right spots, understanding route progression. When I tell you, those rookies went out and put on what I say teach tape for my vets because up until that, up until yesterday, we had not practiced as vets. Yeah. So all I had was rookie tape, <clears throat> and the fact I was able to use these two guys as examples not only. Was it good for the room? But it was good as far as building their confidence is coming into the NFL that, man, because in college you're like, oh, the NFL, oh, man. And then to be able to walk in and do what they did, I wanted to give them their respect for that and pat them on yeah. the back and let them know, guys, y'all belong here. <clears throat> Now go compete. There's a little bit of motivation there too, isn't it, Cal? Absol- There's absolutely. a little bit of motivation is, there for is. the vets too, it, isn't oh, it? You better know it. You better know it. <laughs> yeah, and that's good. And that's that good just for the iron room. sharpens iron, right? It's, good it's that for whole the team. Yeah, it's good for the room and it's good for the team. Because guess what? Even if you're not the starter, you're going to play. And then if you're not the starter, you still can have a very impactful role on this team. Ask Josh Woods. Yeah, special team, explosive player. As Jalen Reeves Maybin. Right. Special teams, explosive players, and when they got the opportunities on defense, they showed up. Germ reaped the benefits of that. It's free agency. Right. Woods is reaping the benefits. He's in the mix. He's 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 in the mix. Woods could be the day one starter. I mean, you Pippen, can close Pippen, your eyes. another guy. Here we go. That's what I'm <laughs> just telling you. And by the way, the name Pitt has been putting on a clinic so far. Once again, it's in shorts, in t shirts. Right. But to see his tenacity with mm-hmm. understanding, I may not get as many reps. I appreciate guys like that because, once again, that was that me. That was you. Like, I might not get as many reps, but when I do get them, they're going to feel my presence. And if you attack it with that mentality, your reps will up as you go. And before you know it, you could be like me starting off in 2016 in the New York Giants linebacker room. I was the third Mike. Week one, we kicked off in Dallas. I had the green dot on my helmet calling the defense. It's about the way you attack it as a player. If you look at a depth chart initially and you go in the tank, you're going to stay in the tank. Right. But if I'm the starter, it, it ain't – because AG say it all the time. It ain't the ones in front you should be worried about. <laughs> it's the ones behind you. Right. And that holds true in the business world, in sports, and everything you do in life. So what's your expectation for this linebacker room – in 2022 you know obviously you want to take a big leap forward and we've talked about how individuals have to collectively do that but as a whole just what's your what's your expectation for this linebacker group in 2022 in this new defense i'm careful on like i don't make any statistical no 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 and that's not what i'm talking anything, about no not, nothing but like that but just you. you want this defense if, if somebody were to say Wow, that Detroit oh, Lions exactly linebacker what group. Absolutely. What, 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 man, what, what defines right that unit? What I'll is that right unit now. about? It's two words. Fast and violent. Fast and violent. That's what I was Fast looking for. Fast and violent. If nothing else, when they turn on our tape, they should hold man. When, 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 when they come at the point of attack, you're in for all day sucker. Fast and violent. I like it. Is the, is the two, and, the, and my players will tell you this. Preach it. And now you have the personalities in there to fit that as well? Absolutely. And guess what? If you don't have that personality, guess what's going to happen? When that cream rises and it is fast and violent, yeah. you're going to fall to the bottom of the pot and just be soaking for us to go clean up at the end of this deal. <laughs> I love it. Now, I want a bigger picture from you defensively. Yeah, obviously, you know, you guys played a lot of young players, and you guys got better as the year went on. But the numbers are the numbers, Calvin, yes. and, and they are what they are. And, and it, like, you look at a lot of the major defensive statistical categories, you guys were just it, it, you know ranked toward the bottom. So what do you – we talked about the scheme change up front, but what, what kind of changes do you want to see this defense as a whole? Is it to take on that mantra of your linebacker core throughout the front in the secondary as well, or just how much improved do you think this defense can be now going into the second season of AG scheme? What I just said, I know for a fact because we see things the exact same. My coordinator is a trickle-down effect, I say. We all speak the same language. If you ask him, fast and violent. Fast and violent. They're, they're, they've almost took away every advantage the defense have at this point yeah. with targets, and rightfully so, with where you can target when you're hitting, where you can do. So what's the one thing that we do still have? To put things on tape when they hit play, they see fast and violent play. And if you put that on tape, people are going to feel you. It's human nature. Yeah. Expanding on, on one guy real quick before, before we end, J.D., a guy that you said you sat next to in the meeting room. Now you're his coach. 
crazy how times yeah. change in, yeah. in so few years, right? But here's a guy that, that could have taken more money elsewhere. Yep. And, and obviously, you guys wanted to re-sign him last year, but the Jets offered him a deal that look, you couldn't yeah. resist, yes. and, and you guys couldn't match. It's yeah. just that's the economics of the NFL. Yes. Yeah. And now he's back. <laughs> and when we talked to him, he, he just seemed to have – boy, this burning desire to, to be good and, and help this team be good. He wants to be part of what you guys are building here. Just how much have you seen his contributions to that room, not only as a veteran guy, but that mentality as well as wanting to be something that's kind of almost greater than yourself? That is the ultimate teammate is what you just described. And, I, and I've grabbed Derrick Bourne's. I said, you know what? I know y'all all competing, but you should be in that guy's hip pocket because I've seen him work. I've seen him pulling up to the facility at 5.45 a.m. every morning. You know why? Because when I find out he was doing it, I said, you crazy if you think I'm letting a rookie do this and I don't. So I was here. And just the accountability piece, if, if, if you could get guys and not disregard the play I'm talking about. I'm talking about everything outside of the play. If you could get your players to operate at the level of that guy. And we have other guys that do it, but we're talking about J.D. right now. Yeah. Like with that burning desire to be great, man. And not just a self thing, like I want to be great for myself, but I want to be great for my team. Whether that because JD, I'll tell you right now, if JD isn't a starter, he's gonna be in Dave Fip office at 6 a.m. I hope Fip ready for that. <laughs> but because of that, listen, that guy, if if he's in between them white lines, because we all know his career hasn't been pretty. Right. Like for a first round pick, it, 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 it that that it has not been ideal for JD. I know that as a friend and his coach. And I know the things he's been through. So that burning desire comes from all different places. But that's just a place of him wanting to be great for his team. And, and it's outstanding, in my opinion. Do you guys now have the, the kind of skill sets? It seems like you've got a pretty versatile group. We talked about Chris Board and Space and some of those other guys and, and Rodriguez and JD's a thumper, we know. Do you have now the, the, the personnel, the skill set, the depth to do a lot of different things that you want to do defensively in terms of matchups with linebackers and, and playing different kinds of schemes and, and sub packages? Absolutely. I think the room – in the defense in total, you add guys like Deshaun Elliott. You, you, you add guys that could potentially have versatility to your defense and flex to where a guy like J.O. I mean, last year, J.O. lined up everywhere. Right. Over the center, on the edge, split out on the number two. Like, you'll see him stack. Like, when, when you're able to have versatile players, it opens up the playbook for the coordinator and versus limiting you. Mm -hmm. And then it keeps guys fresh, too. Because, like I said, Say we come out of this thing once the pads get on and like you it. have four guys and you still don't know. Yeah. Well, then we got to make a decision and we call guys in and we have honest conversations. But in, in terms of that, all right, it's two guys out there. Now we're keeping you fresh. The second you get tired, the next one's rolling. Like, and, and that, so that's not necessarily a bad thing right. either. If you have multiple guys who can play, you utilize them. And we have one, in my opinion, the best coordinator in the NFL and Aaron Glenn, and I promise you he's going to maximize <laughs> violent, fast players. He did last year. Yes, he did. You look we, at we, all the guys that absolutely. you had, some of the young guys. And so there, that's got to be the excitement, too, of those first-year guys going to their second years. Guys like, and I know this is outside your position group, but you mentioned Jerry Jacobs, A.J. Parker, Levi Onzerike, Ali <laughs> McNeil, all those guys. I mean, you guys play off all that it's, it's all unreal. one on defensive so you've got to be excited about the steps that those guys took late in the year so you knew they took coaching right absolutely so if you're if you're this player the beginning of the year this the, uh, and you are better you're not making the same mistakes to me and probably you as a coach that says okay that's a coachable player i can work with that absolutely i just want to see improvements and so, so now we talk about this biggest jump from year one to year two you've got to be excited about some of those guys right oh, just absolutely. collectively throughout the defense everything you just said <clears throat> If you got that towards the latter part of the year, imagine an off season of them in the weight room with Mike Clark and Josh and Mo Jill in the crew. And then the development of OTAs, mini camp to training camp. Oh, absolutely. We are thrilled and excited, <laughs> especially those two big boys you just named, yeah, yeah. and Levi, because that directly uh, affects us. That can open up some <laughs> things for you guys, huh? <laughs> that directly affects us. Well, Calvin, you got me excited about football. I mean, OTAs, again, we have to take it with a there grain of salt. It, it, it's, it's, it's helmets and shorts, but it is 11-on-11. 11 11. We get some 9-on-7 in there. You start to see the football you know, team come together, yes. and it really gets you guys ready for training camp, and that's the hope, right, is just to hit the ground running when you guys are training camp. Absolutely. Just building the foundation, pouring the concrete, 
now put the post up and just continue to build, 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 get the training camp. And then week one come, you sell in the beautiful house and we all reap the investments. Well, let's all reap the investments 100%. Thank you guys for joining me. We'll have another coach on next week. And Calvin, thanks for joining the 20 Minute Huddle. All right, I appreciate you having me. All right. Yeah.